appreciate everybody being here today. Got a lot to cover. Uh, I've talked to these two gentlemen and we're going to kind of give them, give them some guidelines, but let them run from there. They're, uh, they know the subject matter better than the rest of us, so we'll go jump in. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is just the momentum, economic development announcement, SCOUT, FN, Purpose, server pollute, excuse me, Purpose Solutions, Pure Power. Um, starting with uh, Chairman Walker, tell me a little bit about how you're trying to leverage the momentum, be selective, but also knowing that some of these are going to take a couple years to get built out and not passing over the opportunities to present themselves now. Right. We're making, let me just begin. And by the way, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Clearly? Let me just begin by saying uh, thank you to the Chamber uh, for the invitation, uh, for having me this morning. Thank you, uh, Mayor Rickman, for being willing to um, have me sit next to you for what's going to be, a, I think, a, a really good uh, conversation. And also, I'm going to shout out uh, Susan McPherson, uh, because she is the only person in all of uh, South Carolina who could get me anywhere uh, before 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the last time I made it anywhere prior to 8 o'clock, I was in law school. But Susan also happens to be a constituent. So I cannot tell her no. And please remember that come on June 2024, primary season, okay? Uh, but um, what I would tell you all is that, you know, the county has had momentum for quite some time in the area of economic development. And I think you have to go back Prior to my time on Richardson County Council, beginning in 2012, uh, the council uh, commissioned the economic, Richardson County Economic uh, Development Office, and Jeff Rubel heads up uh, that office. And the approach, if you will, to economic development for quite some time, you know, has been buying product, you know, finding sites, finding land, um, industrial parks, what have you, with the aim of attracting. Uh, investment. Uh, that's been one of the ways that we've sort of been able to maneuver or work around you know, some of the challenges or hurdles that our tax structure um, presents. And so if you look at the run that we've been on, especially for the past five years, it's been a rather impressive run. It's been historic. Uh, between 2012 and 2023, if you include Scout, we've seen about $4 billion in capital investment. Um, if you include SCOUT as far as the number of jobs, that's approximately 15,000 jobs created during that period. If you just look at the last, say, three to four years between 2020 and 2023, um, the lion's share of the investment has come during that time. Um, nearly, uh, we're talking close to $3 billion in investment and nearly 7,000 jobs created. Again, that's if you include the $2 billion investment from SCOUT along with uh, the 4,000 jobs that are expected. Uh, so we've had, some, we've had this momentum going for quite some time. You know, I've been told um, you know, that if it ain't broke, excuse the bad language, uh, bad English rather, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so uh, the approach we've taken, it has yielded positive results. Uh, we've been able to grow the tax base, we've been able to create jobs, we've been able to improve our infrastructure, um, we've been able to increase the value of the mill, uh, which is very important when you start talking about the millage rate and making sure that uh, we can pay for services in a growing county uh, without having to raise taxes. So uh, that is what we, we've been doing, uh, making as far as just trying to build on that momentum. Great. And Mayor, can you tell us a little about your, your, your thoughts on this process, how involved you were, and what your staff's doing to leverage this momentum from the city standpoint? Well, first of all, uh, he's being very modest. Uh, a lot of these deals that you see before me going on right now would not happen if it wasn't for his leadership. And I can say that because I sit next to him in a lot of meetings. And, and how someone works with the business community, how they help recruit. And Scout wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the efforts of the chairman and Jeff Rubel. The city had a, obviously a, a major role because without water and sewer, that project wouldn't happen either. So working together to make it um, possible was incredible. But I think one of the things that we're forgetting to talk about here too is, is we've named all the major players. But just in the last 16 months, we've had close to 1,300 new small businesses open. Just here in the city, and I know the county has a whole stack as well, 
people are moving here and taking opportunities. They feel the momentum. They see what's happening around them, and they want to be part of it. And so we got to remember the backbone of this community, why we're excited that Scout's going to be here and it's going to help spin off some smaller spider web businesses, much like we saw in the upstate. You know, there are over 500 companies in the automotive industry in South Carolina. We're going to add a whole lot more right here in the Midlands. But the investment of the small businesses here is, is the backbone of this community and has been for the Midlands for a long time. And I think we're also starting to get the recognition um, as a region that we haven't seen before. And, and I was at the U.S. Conference of Mayors um, the other weekend, and Columbia, South Carolina, as a city and as a region, got more national play in that three-day period without any of us pushing it. People talking about the things that we are doing here in our community and in the region. They talked about the economic growth in the region from Scout. They brought up White Claw. They talked uh, about other, even projects that aren't even supposed to be public, people were talking about. But they were also talking about that we're getting, we're gaining our reputation of being business friendly in a center in a capital city. And I think those things are important as we continue to grow, as we move these barriers and the hurdles out of the way to grow these small businesses, I think we're going to see more growth in our community. I mean, this is the land of opportunity right here in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, Sticking with you, Mayor Rickman, I know when you started serving your first term, a big initiative was the business friendly uh, permitting, all those items uh, being taken into account. What kind of reception do you, have you seen from that? Are you, uh, are you getting positive feedback? Do you feel like the staff has adapted to change I think that what we're seeing in, in so far is that people are, are grasping to what we're doing. You know, when you start taking, you know, sewer expansion things away and opening up the opportunity for somebody to get into a, a space much cheaper and an opportunity, we're making it easier, having more meetings. But we're having less zoning BOSA meetings than we've ever had before. Because changing the code, changing the process has made it easier for things to happen at the staff level. Giving them the technology, the training, and frankly, the autonomy to do their job has made things much swifter. And I think that's why we're seeing the impact that we're seeing on the small businesses, the business license. So that's the best way to look at it. We also look at, you know, last year in 22, we did almost a billion dollars in permitting. For, for upfits and new construction. Um, and that was done very quietly, but it was done because we're getting there. We're getting to the point where it's much easier for people to get there. And I think the staff has embraced it. Aisha Griggers, our uh, head of ODO, is in here. Aisha, raise your hand. She's back there. She's seeing the influx, but she's doing an incredible job about outreach and Ryan. Coleman is in here somewhere. I mean, ER Economic Development, we just brought on Spencer Green to help us with the real estate, uh, to really help us when we're out there recruiting. We want to fill every space. Um, and, and when I say the land of opportunity and why it's important to have that reputation of business friendly is, is next time you're downtown, go to the Capital City Club and look out all four of those windows. And what you'll see is a lot of parking lots across our city. Those all could be filled with people living and working downtown in Columbia, South Carolina. Great. Thank you both. Um, staying on that subject and talking about growth, development, job opportunities, both of you have spoke publicly about the, the imminent need for affordable and workforce housing. Could you always touch on that and how you are collaborating? Because that's, you know, if a new developer's coming in and trying to do that, they need, um, you know, both your, again, and not in all cases, but if there's something that crosses the city's city limits, see both your buy-ins, so you talk about it a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, I'll take that question. So the county, at least up until, I would say this year, really was not in the affordable housing game, uh, to be quite honest with you. Um, but back in 2022, uh, we uh, agreed and adopted a strategic plan. And um, so to make sure that we're not a rudderless council and that we have priorities uh, that we uh, want to not just set as well as uh, meet, we actually decided that we would include what we call uh, inclusive and equitable growth. 
as part of the strategic plan, and part of that included uh, affordable housing. When we received, I believe it was, $80 million in ARPA funds or American Rescue Plan Act dollars from the federal government, uh, four million of that was set aside for affordable housing. Another two million was set aside um, to address homelessness as well. And I'm aware of that, that Greenville, I believe, has even resorted to using economic development uh, as a tool, you know, for you know, trying to expand affordable housing or workforce housing. Uh, I believe they use a special source revenue credit, if I'm not mistaken, but they kind of dangle that out there uh, in an effort to uh, entice uh, developers to include uh, workforce or affordable units. But I think economic development, you kind of stand along that line, um, going beyond incentives, it's about creating jobs that pay a livable wage as well. I think it can't just be, well, let's see if we can uh, build, you know, get, and I'll use this term loosely, but cheap housing, because I think that's what people tend to think, at least that's the stigma uh, that's associated with affordable housing. But how can we make housing more accessible? And so I think you know, uh, one of the best housing programs you can have is a jobs program. When you bring in jobs that pay a livable wage, that allow someone to be able to afford the home of their choice, but I think we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. So as we're trying to increase jobs that pay a livable wage, you also entice developers uh, to create what we would call workforce housing or you know, affordable housing units. I would tell you that <clears throat> We, we need 16,000, almost 17,000 units of housing. We got 5,000 plus people waiting right now for assisted housing in, in the marketplace. So yes, we, we, we've had a lot of conversations because there's a lot of pressure to create a housing trust fund. When you build a housing trust fund, you gotta have a way to fund it long term, not short term, because that money will disappear very quickly. So two things that we looked at is one, we're in the process of surveying. What are our true needs? Um, Greenville embarked in this, and it was a very interesting conversation because 85% of their future needs aren't around single family homes, it's around quadruplexes, duplexes, townhomes, and condominiums. And why is that? Because we have an aging population. The majority of folks that are looking for future housing are going to be baby boomers, single mothers with no kids at home, which is a very large category that we don't talk about a lot. And millennials who just want minimal space and they want to be able to access to come and go. But how do we do that? Well, we have a real need for Class A office space in Columbia. People are downsizing, but they want quality. So we got to create incentives. How do we convert those B and C office spaces into housing that's affordable, creating that workforce housing, keeping people downtown. Because the more density we have downtown, the more opportunity we have for grocery stores, retail, and restaurants. In a community that gets 15 million visitors but only 5 million spend the night, we got to have reasons to, to have people here, and density and life is part of that. And we need to build on the momentum we have. I think the other part is, is that we're going to have to do some creative things. Um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, a group of hedge fund, ex-hedge fund guys got together and created a, a I guess you would call a, a, a financial plan to, to attack affordable housing. And I'm going up there in a couple of weeks to sit down with these folks and they're willing to share the plan with us. They, they don't want to be the investors, but they want to give us the roadmap. The entire plan on how you can build a reoccurring fund and make it, he said, what they have done and realized that to attack affordable housing and truly bring attainable opportunities within the community, you got to have a sustainable model and it has to be a business model. It can't be a subsidy model. It can't be a, a model that's dependent on what administration is in office. And so I'm very excited to see what they've done and how they do it, but we're innovating. And, and I want to give a plug to my, my counterpart of the county because we talk all the time about what we can do collaboratively together, how to tackle these issues, and housing is one of them because there's crossover. And I mentioned earlier we had a lot of pressure around the housing trust fund, but Chairman Walker and I both know that if we put $10 million in a housing fund, 
The five projects that are floating around there right now will eat that up right now because they average about 2.1 million each in gap financing that they need to keep it at that level downtown. That's not a sustainable model. So we got to be creative, and I think this is where the business community and the opportunity, the relationships that we have with other communities, we can take what's worked and bring it here and address the issue. But it is a major issue for us, and it's, it's not getting easier to tackle. And we're going to have to tackle it sooner than later. The city is part of that. It's taking every residential lot it has, and we're putting it out there. We're putting in the infrastructure, and we're working with developers to build those houses and put those back out in the market. We're also consolidating and evaluating every piece of property that we have. We're going to use those properties that we're no longer using or don't have a need for as incentive for housing and business. We're going to approach the state. I'm going to go on record. We are approaching the state. Because if the state's going to continue to move things out of the city, then I want that property for us to use as economic development incentive, not only for business recruitment, but for housing. DHEC leaves this campus. Think about how many downtown affordable, attainable housing structures we could build that would build up our density, would help us with our food desert, help us with our workforce needs, and allow us to detract more and more. We are the capital city. Thank you. Um, speaking of the, you know, the, the bridge gap financing, I saw something in the news last night about a $50 million project proposed for North Main Street and Upper Simmons. Is that something that is under, under consideration for both of y'all? For which project? <laughs> well, uh, We've got so many coming to the game. <laughs> I think it might be the John Will Cadillac site. So we're working with them at the low, at the city level um, because they're part of their structure. They got a kind of complicated structure, and there's some HUD financing. I think uh, Steve Middleton is the developer for that project. He's out of Virginia. He's got a very good track record. Uh, I think it's going to be the first step. We need projects like that to jumpstart. I mean, when you look at that stretch, North Main. How many places in America can you go to? that somebody has an opportunity to buy on Main Street that's affordable and build something and can walk out and point at the state house. I challenge you there's not many places. That is the land of opportunity. We need that first step to show people that there's a path and a willing um, way to do that. I think a lot of their base is looking for, we're working together along with, um, I think Mayor Coble is in here from NPC. Um, uh, Maynard, excuse me, they changed their name, um, but working with us to help the county and the city come up with a standard incentive. Great. Um, it wouldn't be a chamber event if we didn't talk about tax modernization. And I know that uh, Chairman Walker, that you've, uh, your council has rejected the last two bond um, issues and increases to keep that in line. And obviously, they can put the tax modernization committee in place and got that underway. Where do we go from here? Um, how are y'all collaborating? When will the state get involved? Uh, what the delegation? We just love two minutes from each of y'all, if possible, about where you see that going. You said just two minutes? Uh, well, you talk to us. You've got, you got 27 more minutes before you get to court. So you can well, as much time as you want to. Well, it's an important issue. Um, so taxes, you know, I find myself, you know, you know asking uh, if taxes will ever be low enough. And I don't ask that question uh, sarcastically, um, but we live in a state where we have some of the lowest income taxes. We have some of the lowest sale taxes. Uh, we have uh, some of the lowest owner-occupied uh, taxes. And you got Act 388, which then exempts additional properties from the tax rolls. And then the governor, I believe, recently signed, well, in 2022, that was the Comprehensive Tax Reduction Act, which effectively dropped the assessment ratio uh, from 9% to 6% for manufacturing. And we still hear that taxes are uh, too high. And so that's why I asked myself the question, uh, do, do we ever reach a point where we feel that taxes are low enough? Now, let me just say this. Um, I think two things can be true at once. 
with respect to, I guess, the tax structure being a, a barrier or a challenge to growth, at least from the county's vantage point, that has not been the case. Um, you know, you've heard me rattle off some of the statistics over the past, you know, decade, as far as what the county has been able to accomplish in the area of economic development. But I also understand, you know, that for um, investment properties and, um, and commercial properties that don't qualify for many of those incentives, that don't qualify multi-county industrial park incentive, they don't qualify for the special source revenue credit, they don't qualify for the fee and little tax. I understand that, you know, taxes, it can be a challenge. And so the mayor and I, you know, we've, we've had, so we've been having those conversations, we'll continue uh, to have, you know, conversations. Uh, as far as the tax modernization study, I certainly believe that it is a good faith effort, you know, to make us more competitive uh, from a tax standpoint, when you start talking about non-owner occupied properties uh, or investment properties uh, and the like. But it does present some challenges for the county. I would say keep in mind that the county has not yet commissioned a study. You know, the study was commissioned by the city. The mayor has been uh, more than generous with his time in sharing that with us. We've had multiple conversations about it. Uh, We've, uh, he's met with me as well as the auditor, the treasurer, the county administrator. There's going to be another roundtable discussion. Uh, but the challenges presented you know, to us as a county is that it would require us to, I guess, implement, if you will, some um, rather, I would say, austere measures when, you, when, you, when it requires you to actually scale back on spending and, uh, and any revenues you see from new growth, as well as the additional revenues from uh, spending cuts, that would go into an escrow account to then eventually pay for, um, you know, any sort of reduction in the assessment ratio. And so, you know, the county, when a county that's growing, um, and a county, with a county council, that we're already running on a pretty tight budget. Uh, you know, currently the county has a AAA credit rating. The county has received numerous awards uh, for being fiscally uh, prudent and what have you, but that's because we are on a uh, very tight budget. And so any funds that we actually, I uh, guess any surplus revenues, if you will, that usually goes into uh, our fund balance. And that fund balance uh, you know, is used uh, for purposes of our credit rating, so in the event we have to borrow, uh, say for major projects, we make sure we get the lowest uh, interest rates. Uh, the other piece of this is, you know, the county we do, you know, have a lot of uh, major uh, projects that are going to be coming up here pretty soon. You know, we've got, um, you know, the 911 service, uh, 911 emergency services. That's that's a $40 million bond we've had to take out. We're going to have to pay for that. You know, we've got the Family Services Center. That's one of these unfunded state uh, mandates. You know, there are certain state agencies that the county is required to provide uh, facilities for uh, without any assistance from the state. That's going to run us nearly $40 million. Um, we also have the jail that we're still dealing with. That's going to run us approximately $25 million. Uh, and then, you know, we're talking about a new courthouse as well. I'm not sure last time any of you have been to 1701. Uh, Main Street, you know, but it's, we can do better to say that we're the capital city uh, and the courthouse ought to be one of our crown jewels if it, uh, with respect to it being a county building and unfortunately it's not, but that's going to run us nearly $200 million. And so at this point, I believe with the county, what we anticipate is any, I guess, revenues that we may see from future growth, yes, we will continue to use those funds to increase our fund balance. But at the same time, we're going to have to use those funds to pay, you know, for major projects that will be coming down the pipeline. Uh, so the mayor and I, we will continue to have conversations. We'll continue to talk about tax modernization. I think it's going to be coming upon the county at some point to at least have our own study commission and one that takes into account uh, our ability to generate revenue uh, to provide or you know, to make sure that we have the agencies that we uh, fund and continue to provide the vital services that many of our residents need 
I often tell people, you know, the uh, city is a, uh, is a corporation, but the county is a conglomerate. We just don't have Richland County government that we take into account for purposes of funding. We've got the school districts, three school districts, rather. Uh, we've got um, Midwest Technical College. We've got the library. We've got the zoo. We've got Columbia Area uh, Mental Health. We've got Richland County Recreation Commission. Uh, and that's before you get to the Sheriff's Department, which comprises a third of the entire county budget. Uh, the coroner's office, the solicitor's office, uh, the clerk of court, and so on. So I think before the county can go down the road of committing to, I guess, tinkering, if you will, with the assessment ratios or doing anything that could impact our revenues, we would have to ensure uh, at least commission a study that takes into account our needs as well as our ability to generate the revenues to uh, provide for those agencies, which in turn provide, you know, just essential services for our residents. Thank you. Um, well, you yeah, know, we've been meeting, and I'll have to disagree with my, my colleague here on, on the approach, because the study actually does show us as a whole, as a county, and it accounts for the growth. We've been living off 1.5% growth for over a decade, so it's a historical. When we put this plan together, the plan was over a 10-year period, so the first two years, and we can set the growth rate, and we have the ability to set the growth rate where we need to, but we've accounted for all these things in the past. We can account for them in the future, but long-term, the play here is to reduce our taxes, because we're, we're 30, on average 34% more expensive than any other city in South Carolina. All right, Charleston is 48% is less than we are. Greenville's 38% less than. So when we talk about funding agencies and this and that, well, well part of the issue here has been is that we've allowed the agencies to benefit from the, the, the value of the millage and not capture that for other uses as well. I'll give you an example. The school board asked for a funding and millage increase this year. Well, you know, just the value of the millage was going to give them close to $14 million without even having to ask. So we've got to truly analyze those costs and looking at the revenue and the future growth. We lower taxes and build up the tax base. It's going to far exceed any money that somebody may lose. You're not going to lose money when you're talking about lowering a quarter percent of the tax structure over a 10-year period. It really happens the first two years kind of caps. We create a financial bridge, a reserve fund to protect us from anything moving forward. We put a floor in there. If we don't see the growth, then we know we have to stop it. We build in a floor to that. But when you look at it over a course of the period, what makes us competitive, right now, every big business is getting an incentive. But 98% of the businesses around here are small businesses. They're not getting that. And so we've got to do something. You can't talk about affordable housing if you're not talking about taxes because the renters are paying the property tax. Right now, the average collection is three and a half months of collected rent is what goes to pay for the taxes. This is huge when you start talking about competitiveness. Look, we're fighting landlords every day who are absentee landlords that aren't putting money back in. How are we going to create a competitive nature if people can't come here? We can't build 300-unit apartment complexes at the tune of 80 to $120 million everywhere. We need the ability for folks to build small individual units for people to be able to have those secondary properties. And I, I want to give you an example of what the, the, the Delta is here. We've got a house that's assessed at $580,000 in, in, in the city. They're paying around $4,200 a year. The same building on the commercial side is paying close to $16,000 a year. That's money that's not going back in to cover health, employee health plans that they, to grow. To do That's what's keeping us from growing, is that competitive. And I know the county doesn't hear it as much as we do, but it is a huge, huge issue for the small businesses, even for larger investments. We had a $60 million project coming in that would provide uh, apartments in, in an area where we needed help. 
The same project in Greenville cost them on a tax structure roughly around $3,200 a unit. Here it would be $5,000 a unit. That's based on what the assessor was prior. We don't have a choice but to address this issue. We have an avenue with the legislature to do it. We've got state legislators willing to help us and create an opt-in program. But what we have to do with the county is, is build a pathway and show what the true effect is. We're not talking about going from six to four in year one. We're talking about over a 10 year period. Slowly build it in so that we can recruit and build. We had over 100 people in the, in, the, in the tax modernization meeting. And I simply asked, and these are folks from all over the Southeast. I said, if we implemented a plan like this, would you invest today or would you wait till year 10? Hands raised up, they would start investing today because they know the pathway. We need these type of investors to grow, and at the same time, we need to have the ability to support the small business growth. When you got folks calling you, so I'll give you an example, uh, a pizza vendor who owns a pizza place out in the Northeast, his base rent is $22 a square foot. The time he reconciles at the end of the year is $36 a square foot. Where do you think that money's coming from? That's coming from his bottom line. Any of those that have been in the restaurant business? It's a nickel business, folks. We need to, we need to protect every penny. And the increase in costs for supply and demand today, insurance, gas, utilities, and then taxes. We have the ability to levelize these taxes by working together and budgeting. Yes, there's gonna to have to be some budgeting, but we've already done it at one and a half percent growth, so if we make it 2% growth and we account for the future needs, but for everybody coming in with Scout, everything else, think about what we did. If there's not a better opportunity to do it, I don't know when there is. And there's a way to protect us. But we have to sit down and do it, and we can't look at it as doomsday today. I've heard, you know, folks say, well, the school district needs more money. The school district is, has more money than most school districts in the state. I have to tighten my belt every, every year, and so should other folks. We got to work together. But if we don't fix it and we continue to grow, and I will tell you, the population, we, we lost the Senate seat and the House seat in the city, which is also in the county. So that tells you there's some shifting going on. We got to think strategically about what our long-term growth pattern is going to be and how, how we're going to compete. Because when we talk about taxes, corporate taxes, you talk about income taxes, our neighboring states are, have been lowering corporate tax, property tax for the last decade. There's a reason why Raleigh's at 12.5% growth. There's a reason why the bedroom communities around Charlotte and other places are growing. There's a reason why the state of Georgia is growing at the rate it is. We have all the aspects for quality of life and everything, but this is a major component that we have to address. And there's a way to do it. And we've talked a lot about looking at it from different angles. That's why we're going to get back in the room and say, let's come up with something that makes sense not only for the small guys, but for the future investors that keeps us competitive. Because the Midlands has more opportunity in any part of the state. That's why Scout's here. We've got a built-in workforce. We have three major highways. We have a quality of life. We have things that other communities dream about. But our biggest hindrance is that we've had the reputation of being business unfriendly and tax heavy. And part of it is, is we got to look internally. We got to understand the value of our millage rates. We need to, to, to work together, you know, to do things. And I'm, you know, I, I brought it up before and I'll bring it up again. I support the zoo's growth, but I don't support it with property tax. I want to support it with hospitality and accommodations tax, because that's why those taxes are in place. We need to understand the value. We need to make sure that when we're moving forward, that when someone asks us for a millage rate or a bonding capacity, like the library did years ago, we need to make sure that we're capping it at that value and that growth goes back to the county so that they can continue to move things forward and take care of these problems. So yes, I believe there's a path. 
Yes, there is support for it, but it's incumbent on all of us to show support and hear their voices that this is a major issue for our region. Thank you. Make it, if I may, I just want to add to what the mayor uh, has said. Um, I think it's important for everyone in this room to know that the county has not raised its millage in over five years. Um, the, as well, the county council has not raised the school district's millage in, I want to say, maybe almost five, six years now. And that has a lot to do with you know, the concerns that we've heard you know, about uh, taxes in the county. Uh, but it also, as I said to the media, when a request comes before me, I have to reconcile you know, the needs of that agency with the bandwidth of residents to absorb a tax hike. So I just want to be very clear about that, that we have not increased the millage for the county's general fund, nor for the school districts going on almost five, six years now. I think another piece that, that's oftentimes excluded from the conversation about taxes uh, is property values. Because when you look at how a tax bill is calculated, you've got fair market value, you've got the assessment ratio, and then you've got the millage rate. And your, your property value or total uh, assessed property value in a county, that is what will drive the millage rate oftentimes. In Richmond County, the value of the mill, in my most recent conversation with the auditor, uh, was 1.8 million. So pretty much one mill would generate 1.8 million in uh, property tax revenue. Then when you get to Charleston, the value of the mill there is approaching five million. So they're able to you know, charge or assess a much lower millage rate or fewer mills, generate more revenue for services that are needed while at the same time more in the tax bill. Uh, so in some ways, it's not a fair comparison. And what drives the property values in uh, Charleston has a lot to do with all the multi-million dollar uh, properties that they have there. I think we have thousands. In Richmond County, we may have, you know, a few hundred. Uh, and you look at Greenville, they have over 600 uh, manufacturing, uh, manufacturers rather. We don't have anything close to that in Richland County. So we're on the right path. The mayor and I will continue to have uh, very candid conversations about this. His heart is in the right place. My heart is uh, in the right place. But I'm also realistic about the challenges, why we're in the position that we're in when it comes to taxes. It's not because of profligate government spending, you know, at the local level. Um, it has more so to do, you know, with the value of properties, you know, Emerson County, when you juxtapose them with property values in Charleston versus property values in Greenland. Thank you, Bill. Um, a few more minutes and we're going to finish up. Actually, Chairman Walker, let's you go first. Um, since you have a hard stop, if, uh, uh, here, we must continue on. We've got a little bit more time. Uh, it's something that's uh, near and dear to the community, well, to, to attract the businesses and develop steps. That's public safety and also the premises issues. And obviously, uh, Mayor Ripley had a good uh, news conference yesterday. So uh, I'll let you start. Uh, Chairman Walker, I'll tell you when it's your drop dead time. And then uh, Mayor Ripley, um, if you've got time to stay, you know, for a few minutes and address what we talked about yesterday. Fantastic. So, make can tell me what's the question. Uh, just talking about the status of uh, yeah. public safety, how are you involved in your staff with that, keeping sure. your officers you know, on payroll, um, you gotcha. know, all, all, those, all the above? Well, you know, the mayor, I would say, is probably more directly involved with public safety than I am because he has a police chief that reports to him, uh, whereas I don't have, you know, the sheriff doesn't report to the Richmond County Council. The sheriff is... Uh, a constitutional elected uh, office. Uh, he runs for office just like I do, and he is, uh, you know, he is beholden to the voters and not Richland County Council. However, we do fund the Sheriff's Department. I know for County Council, we take a pretty comprehensive approach or view when it comes to public safety. Uh, it's not just the Sheriff's Department, it's EMS, it's the Solicitor's Office, 
it's the coroner's office as well. And so uh, when I get asked questions, okay, well, what is your perspective on public safety in the county or if you think the county is safe or not, I often say I'll just defer to the folks with the subject matter expertise, which would be the sheriff, which would be the solicitor. Uh, but if you would ask me in an anecdotal sense, no, I don't feel unsafe in my own county. I mean, I've lived here for, I'm 42 years old. I've been here since 1986, 87, how many, how many years uh, that is. Um, but I do recognize that there are communities uh, that are unsafe. There are communities uh, that are dealing with gun violence. The mayor and I just sat on a panel together with NAACP this past Sunday talking about that issue. Uh, gangs, I know in certain communities are an issue, uh, as well as uh, illegal drugs. So we know that uh, crime is an issue uh, in Richmond County. Plus it's a, a problem uh, nationwide. But what we try to do is make sure that we support the Sheriff's Department, we support the Solicitor's Office, we support uh, EMS, we support the Coroner's Office, make sure that there's adequate funding. I think I said earlier, the Sheriff's Department comprises nearly a third of the entire county budget. Well, the you know, county budget for fiscal year 24 is just over 200 million, so you all do the math on that, and you can, uh, you can sort of glean from there uh, county council's commitment to public safety, but I don't think it's sufficient, you know, to be, you know, I guess tough, if you will, on crime. You got to get tough on the causes of crime, and I think the best uh, anti-crime program goes back to economic development, the jobs program. I think if you can put people to work, uh, engage in workforce development, make sure they have uh, educational resources there, you provide the jobs that pay a livable wage people less likely to be involved in you know, criminal conduct, um, you know, children who grow up in homes that are, what I would say, economically stable, but less likely uh, to be involved in you know, criminal activity uh, or behavior. Uh, so that's the approach that County Council uh, is taking. We're making sure that uh, you know, we're, we're paying our deputies well. In fact, we uh, allocated $3 million out of, uh, out of our funds to increase pay for our entire public safety uh, apparatus. Uh, two million of that will go towards the sheriff, the remaining million uh, will go to the solicitor's office, Richmond County uh, EMS, I think some will go to the coroner's office as well. We also uh, are implementing a 4% cost of living adjustment for this upcoming fiscal year. That will be the second cost of living adjustment well, for all in, um, county employees, but, uh, but the sheriff's department and other public safety agencies, that will be twice now over the course of one year. Uh, and so those are the things um, that we're doing uh, to try to make sure that our community is safe and that it remains right uh, for uh, economic development and that we have a community that where people feel that they, uh, they can safely live, work, and, uh, and thrive. Thank you. Let's take a call before uh, Mayor Rickmanders uh, responds and uh, thank Chairman Walker for joining us today. We'll get you all for it on time. So. I'll wait for you. Mayor Rickman, same question, but if you could also focus on your press conference yesterday and the issue you put in place and the impact relatives to our homeless uh, population in downtown. I think that would be important for those of y'all who can see the news uh, conference yesterday. Um, so, you know, public safety is the number one issue that we deal with every day. And I'll tell you, every night I go to bed, I hope that um, my phone doesn't ring. Because one of the things I'm scared about every day in our community is somebody else being shot. Violent crime has become, as, as I said, coming back from the U.S. Conference of Mayors, there wasn't one conversation that we didn't have. But believe it or not, some of the policies and the things that we are trying in the community are making natural. One of the, the, the programs that was hinted on the, uh, in the mayor's press conference, I didn't know it was going to happen, but they pulled Columbia, South Carolina, they talked about our handle with care. It's our program where officers work with the school system to let them know that a child has been involved in, in a violent crime or seen it or been part of it in their neighborhood so they can plan to have the counselors and everyone in there working with them to get there. Public safety, look, we, we got a crisis, folks, on our, our police officers. Folks are not lining up to become police officers anymore like they are. We have a shortage. So we're having to be creative because we can't continue to poach from each other in, in the area. 
We can't have people going from the county back to the city and then to Lexington and then the Department of Corrections. We're just recycling. So we're doing everything we can um, today to recruit. We've stabilized, uh, we've increased funding, we take on cars, we've been invested in technology and training. We're using a lot of technology, um, but we're also bringing in private security um, to help to handle property crime requests, false alarm calls, things like that, so that our officers can focus. But there are more tools out there for us to use that we can put keep our officers focused on major crimes. Speed cameras and red light cameras, you don't think it's a big deal, but an average officer, when he shows up to an accident, it's an hour and a half of his day. So if we can eliminate that, think about the time, and it's different. The sheriff doesn't have to deal with accidents. He doesn't have to deal with homeless. He can focus on crime. Our guys spend downtown corridor, and this is why we're looking at private security to take, take a role in it. So we took the hotspots, 911, and, and, and looked at it. 70% of our calls in that area have to do with petty crime drunkenness, addiction problems, property crimes. We're sending multiple resources. So we have to deal with the hot spots, but we have to invest. So we're announcing in the next two weeks, we're bringing forth candidates for the Office of Violence Prevention to have a quarterback, somebody who's got a long history and in this field to work with our youth, bring all these groups together to start to help do the three things we know. So we know people, places, and behavior. It's about 1% square mile of distance of our community and focus on those hot spots so that we can put in prevention, intervention, and law enforcement. Putting crisis teams, we've hired five pathway units. These, these folks are clinicians that come through the Department of Health that are working with our officers to deal with crises, both in our unsheltered population and in our, our violent population. We're building up crisis teams to work to start to get into the prevention, but we also have other challenge. Our judicial system is not working for us, folks. Meadow Lake, the 11 kids who were shot, the shooters, I already been arrested three times in a, lot, in a 60 day period before that with, with, and had unlawful weapon. It is a revolving door. We can't get our neighborhoods to support our police department because they're afraid that those people by the weekend will be back in their neighborhoods. We've got to change the narrative. And by doing that, by continuing to invest in our, our force, try unique recruiting, but addressing the problem, working with our communities, changing our conditions, livable conditions, putting pride back in our neighborhoods. I spent the weekend this weekend riding around. I rode 278 miles across this city. I went to every neighborhood that was in the city of Columbia just to see what's going on. What are the kids doing? What do our neighborhoods look like? What are the challenges that we need to be looking at, real-time challenges? We're investing in lighting, fixing our sidewalks, cleaning up things like limbs. Those are safety issues that create, but we gotta get our, our community together back to clean up. We're tackling our, our landlords. And I say this because y'all, our most vulnerable population has been left with nobody fighting for them. The colony apartments had 157 calls for service last year. And we all know what happened. We've heard about the crime, the shootings there. But what you don't know, and you may not know, is that during Christmas, for four days, an entire community had no heat and no water. And the only reason any of us find out about it is because somebody got shot and killed. And when the police arrived, the neighbors started talking. They felt so disenfranchised that they didn't even let their neighborhood leaders know. So yes, we're fighting with HUD, we're suing the owners, we're doing everything we can to go after it because we've got to change the conditions. 
And that's part of why tax modernization is important. We need, we need people making investments in new quality housing so that we can put people into housing and quality. We need to show people how they can get into home ownership and cross out of situations that, that we, we don't need 300 unit apartment complexes. We need smaller unit singles. We need our community to work together with us because it's a community issue volunteering and being in people's lives every day, not just showing up once a month and then going to church on Sunday and say, I did a good deed. There's groups like Pray Cola and Love Columbia that are lining up volunteers to make a, uh, effects in these communities. So we're looking at this public safety from all angles. It's about investing in, in our, our children, early prevention job creation. We're working with Christy Savage. We created a skilled working center. Now you can go get trained for HVAC and electrical work right here at our incubator. We're building a neighborhood incubator in the Booker Washington Heights to give a place that the city's funding where neighborhood nonprofits and startups have the ability to have space, a cubicle, where they have access to the internet and copiers and things so they can build up themselves and have an opportunity. We're working with the state to get funding. We've gotten close to $4 million to build a community center and a gymnasium in a neighborhood that has nothing to give these kids an opportunity. We're investing in our parks and our parks programs. We're working with every opportunity there is out there. So it's not just about police recruitment, but it's also about working on the judicial system. It's working about how we build up the quality of life for individuals at better housing stock. Showing people a path for uh, opportunities, creating more opportunities for apprenticeships. We've got to show people that there's a different path than violence. Violence prevention should be our number one thing. Domestic violence is like 31% in our community. Shootings up 18%, now 118 shootings last year. 93% of those shootings were young males between the ages of 18 and 20. There are more jobs available than there ever is, but we gotta show people that they can get those jobs. We gotta show people how they do an interview, how they prepare themselves to go get those jobs. So as we talk about public safety, we're doing the things you all know about, but there's a lot of things we're doing to change the opportunities out there and show people there's a different path. So just remember, prevention, intervention, and law enforcement are our three avenues. And let's focus more on prevention and intervention than law enforcement, because putting somebody in jail is not solving the problem either. Thank you, Mayor Rickman. Appreciate your time today. Everybody, a round of applause for Mayor